So if your life were made into a movie, what kind of movie would it be? And we started with on Easter Sunday, and since then we've talked about some of the things that every great movie or every great story uh, have in common. But there's one thing that we haven't talked about that every great movie or every great story uh, has in common without exception, and that's that every great movie includes a great script. So you can have the, the best cast of characters, the, the greatest actors in the world, led by the greatest director in history. But unless you've got a script that tells a compelling story, the best you'll be able to do is produce a movie that's only moderately interesting. To tell a great story, you have to have a great script. In the filmmaking industry, film screenwriters uh, usually follow a familiar pattern. It's called the, the three-act structure. I'm going to put a picture up on the screen just so you can see what we're talking about. And the first act, act one, it's called the setup, and that's where you're introduced to the main character and the challenge or challenges that that main character is going to have to overcome. Then you get to act two, which is called the confrontation, and that's where the main character works to overcome all of these obstacles that are a part of overcoming the challenge. And then you get to act three, which is called the resolution. It's always the climax of the story. It's where all the questions get answered, the loose ends get tied up, all the tension gets resolved, and more often than not, everybody lives, you know, happily ever after, at least in most popular movies. According to a guy named Ray Morton, who wrote a best-selling book about screenwriting, it's the third act, or the resolution stage, that's most important whenever you're telling a story. He said it like this in a best-selling book. He said, a story without an ending is just a series of events and incidents that might be entertaining, but that ultimately don't go anywhere and don't mean anything. He continues, a story without an ending isn't satisfying. After investing ourselves in a narrative for two or so hours, we want to know if the lovers get together. We want to find out who committed the murder. We want to see villains defeated, obstacles overcome, and demons inside and out quelled. And if they're not, we want to have a clear understanding of why. Now, if you have your Bible or your phone, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. This morning we're going to conclude our Live a Better Story series by talking about how to write a happy ending for your story. So one way to think about it is like this. If I handed you a blank piece of paper and I asked you to describe what happily ever after would look like for you, what would you write down? If you're like most people, buried somewhere in the recesses of your mind, you have a picture or a vision of what you hope the end of your life looks like. You have some sort of goal, some sort of dream about what you hope it all ends up to be. And, and while, the, while the details might differ from person to person, there are three key elements that almost all of us would include that would be a part of our happy ending. For example, when we get to the end of our lives, most of us want to find ourselves in happy circumstances. And here's what I mean by that. You want your health to be good. You want your bank account to be full. You want your retirement to be secure. Uh, you don't want any outstanding issues. I mean, we're all kind of looking to end our days with, with just happy circumstances. Then most, if not all of us, whenever we, we think about the future, we think about living, you know, the good life. So, you know, everything's good. And then we've got happy places. Now, most people have like a happy place. You might even use that term, or maybe it's it's happy places, and as you get closer to the finish line of your life, if you're like most people, you're hoping to spend more time in your happy place. So you're going to move to the beach, you're going to buy that new boat, you're going to finally you know, build that cabin that you've always wanted, and then as a part of that, you're also hoping that there'll be some happy people that are around you. Most of us want to live in such a way as, as, so that as we get older, our kids and our grandkids, rather than avoiding us want to hang out with this and be a part of what we're doing. So most of us, we think about, you know, happy circumstances, happy places, happy people, and that will be a happy ending. Now, I've got a picture I want to show you. This won't resonate with everybody, but this is what some people think about when they think about the end. You're, you're with somebody you love in a place you love, doing what you love to do, 
and it all looks perfect, and that's kind of the happy ending that most of us are looking for. It's happy circumstances plus happy places plus happy people we think equals a happy ending. Or at least that's what we've been taught to think. But what if that was wrong? What if a happy ending required more than just happy circumstances, happy places, and happy people? Now, I want you in your mind to contrast the picture you just saw with this next picture that I want you to see. This is the inside of a holding cell, or you might call it a dungeon, inside of Rome's Mamertine prison. It was originally constructed about 700 years before for the birth of Jesus, and by the time the first century rolled around, it had become a holding facility for prisoners who had been condemned to death. This was the place you went. This was sort of like death row while you were waiting for the day of your execution to arrive. It was the place you went to wait to die. It was also the place where historians tell us the Apostle Paul One of the heroes of the New Testament spent the the final days of his life chained to the floor, cold and hungry, covered in mud and filth and human waste, waiting to die. One of the unhappiest places that you can imagine. But while he was there, while he was on death row, waiting for the the hammer to drop and the day of his execution to arrive, he wrote one final letter to a younger associate of his named Timothy. And at this point in his story, Paul knows that the end is near. There's not going to be any last-minute pardons. Nobody's going to come rushing in at the last minute with a stay of execution signed by the governor. This is the end of the road with each passing day, Paul knows that his time is running out. From one perspective, it looks like a tragic end to what had started as a great story. If you were to apply the three-act structure to Paul's life, it would go something like this. In Act 1, you'd be introduced to a young man on the rise. He graduated from the most prestigious university. He made the dean's list every semester. When he was born into a prominent family, when he finally graduated, he was on the fast track to becoming a a major political player. I mean, in, in the first part of Paul's life, he was the guy that got invited to speak at all the graduations. He was the guy that delivered all the TED Talks. If If meet the press had been a thing, he would have been a frequent guest. But then in Act 2, Paul has this moment that radically redirects his life. It happens when he encounters the resurrected Jesus, and from that point forward, everything was different. He spends the rest of his life until the end of his life traveling the world, training leaders, planting churches, preaching messages, doing everything he can to advance the kingdom of God on earth. But then you get to Act 3, and the story changes rather dramatically, and at that point it feels as if the tide has turned, and it looks as if his enemies have finally triumphed over him. Under a direct order from the Roman Emperor Nero, Paul's been taken into custody, he's been convicted of crimes against the state, and he's been sentenced to death. Then to make it worse... By the time you get to the end of Act 3, it looks as if it's going to be the complete opposite of a happy ending. See, the Mamertine prison was not a happy place. These were not happy circumstances, and he's been isolated from all the people that love him, so there are no happy people around him to cheer him up. I mean, this is like if somebody handed you a piece of paper and said, I want you to describe the unhappiest ending you could ever think of, that's what Paul's experiencing. It is almost unimaginable what he's going through. And yet what you discover as you read this final letter is that rather than giving in to the despair and the anger and the frustration that you would expect to find, Paul is still experiencing a happy ending. Check out how he says it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed 
for his appearing. Now, you look at this. There are four things that Paul experiences right at the end that help him uh, experience a, a happy ending even though he's trapped in an unhappy place. If you're keeping track uh, on your outline in the bulletin, here's the first one. A happy ending starts with a clear understanding. And the understanding is that you know that your time is limited. In Psalm 90, Moses, the great hero of the Old Testament, said this. He said, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. According to Moses, there's something about knowing that your time is limited, that knowing, being aware of your own mortality that enables you to live with wisdom. It allows you to make better decisions. And, and I know we don't like to think about it, man, but there is a sense in which the clock is ticking for all of us. Paul said it like this. He said, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near, or your translation might say, has come. Now, under the Old Testament law, a drink offering, what they would do, they would take a cup of red wine, they would go to the altar where they had laid out a lamb, and before they would light the lamb, they would pour this red wine over the body of the lamb. And the idea was that as they lit it on fire, the aroma would go up to heaven and it would please God. But the thing about a drink offering that was different from every other offering is that once you poured out the wine, you were never going to get that back. You couldn't recover wine that had been offered from the ground. So it was the idea of I'm giving everything I've got. I'm giving something of value up that I know that I'll never be able to recover. And so as Paul compares his life to a drink offering, he's literally saying, I've given everything I have to give. I've held nothing back. Everything has been given in service to the king. And the way he writes this in Greek, he uses what's called the, the present imperative. He demonstrates that, that Paul knows this is something that is already happening. His life is literally being poured out day by day. This is not something that is the future. It's something that's happening. That's why he says that the time of his departure is near. And the word he used for departure in Greek is the same word you would use to describe a boat or a ship that had just been untied from the dock or a tent that had just been taken down and, and gathered up as the soldiers break camp and they move to a new place. It's the same image he used in 1 Corinthians 15 when he compares our human bodies to a tent. Now, here's the thing about a tent. You graduates, you need to write this down. If you find yourself living in a tent... Something's gone wrong. I mean, if you have a tent and that's your permanent address, life is taking a bad turn. A tent is never meant to be permanent. It's always meant to be temporary. And so Paul says the same thing is true of our human bodies and our earthly lives. These are not permanent. They were always designed to be temporary. Now, you might have noticed a few minutes ago, I flipped this uh, little hourglass. And in my defense... This looked a lot bigger on Amazon. I ordered this, and I thought it was big, but it's not, so you have to bear with me. Uh, and just so you know, this is a 30-minute hourglass. So if this thing runs out and I'm still going, I'm going to flip it back over. Just so you know, this is no indication of how the sermon's going to go, but it is a good illustration of what happens to our lives. You, you're born, you take your first breath, and I know we don't like to think about this because it's uncomfortable, but what happens the moment you take your first breath, it's like there's this hourglass that gets flipped, and the sand that is your life starts to run out from the moment you're born because it's temporary. And the scary part is you don't know how much time you started with. Hopefully, Still got a few decades to go. But the one thing the Bible's clear on, and the one thing experience has taught all of us, is that nobody is promised tomorrow. In fact, you're not even promised the rest of today. The only thing we know for sure is that someday, the time of your departure and the time of my departure will come. And until you realize that, you're unprepared to deal with it. Now, here's the second thing. A happy ending also requires a completed 
mission. In verse 7, Paul wrote, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And in Greek, he uses what's called the perfect tense, which indicates this is a completed action. From his perspective, this is a fight that's already been fought, it's a race that's already been run. So one way to think about it, he's completed the semester, he's turned in all the assignments, the grades are in, and now his graduation day is quickly approaching. The question then is, what was Paul's assignment? You say, well, he was a preacher, but he was even more than that. He was assigned to be a preacher to the Gentiles. 1 Timothy chapter 2, he said it like this, and for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Even Paul understood there was some irony about somebody like him, the ultimate insider, being appointed as a preacher to a group of people that were considered the ultimate outsiders. But that was his fight. That was his race that he was created to run. Your fight and your race probably look different. But at some point, God has something that he wants you to do. There, there's some fight that he wants you to engage in. There is some race that he wants you to run. Hebrews 12, the Hebrew writer said it like this. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And then don't miss this part. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, your race will look different than my race. And my race will look different than your race, but the point is, God has a race marked out for you that he wants you to run. And my suspicion is that if you think about it hard enough, you already have some inclination as to what it is that God wants you to do. Maybe you've already been doing it for a long time, and you just feel like you're just starting to hit your stride. Or maybe you've been doing it a long time, and just like Paul, you can feel yourself inching closer and closer to the finish line. Or if you're like a lot of people, you're, for whatever reason, you're, you're still standing in the starting box, and you know what it is you're supposed to do. You just haven't found the courage to do it. It's like you're, you're waiting for that imaginary gun to go off so you can start running. But here's the thing about an assignment and about a race and about a mission. You never finish until you get started. I know that's really deep. You might think about that. But you never, you never finish until you get started. And so if you want to be like Paul, if you want to get to the end of your life and look back over your life and say, you know what, I completed the mission, I ran the race, I fought the fight. If you want to be able to do that, at some point you have to get started. You can't wait. Now here's the third thing. Writing a happy ending should include a growing faith. Paul said, I have kept the faith. And what he means by that is he's continued throughout all the decades of following Jesus, through all the ups and downs, he's continued to believe the gospel. So you keep reading in 2 Timothy 4 from verse 9 and really until the end of the letter, he closes it out with just some, some personal comments, just like you would if you were writing to somebody that you love. So he talks about people he misses, he talks about a couple people that have disappointed him. He asked Timothy to say hi to some people for him. And then you get to verse 13, and he makes kind of a weird request of Timothy. He says, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now, the coat, you kind of understand. I mean, historians tell you that the Mamertine prison was always cold and damp, so the, the coat makes a lot of sense. I mean, of course, he'd want to wrap up and and get a little warmer. But what about the scrolls and the parchments? What is he talking about? Well, the best guess is that what he's talking about is this collection of documents that would have included maybe certain Old Testament books, maybe early versions of the books that later became the, the New Testament, or maybe some combination of both. Now, here's the question. Why would a guy like Paul, who'd already memorized the Old Testament and wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, why would he need a collection of, of documents that he could read? I mean, why would he be worried about reading anything when he knows that his end is here? 
What would the connection be? And the answer is, Paul was worried about it because he wanted to end his life like he had spent his life. He wanted to stay engaged until the very end. Now, some of you remember back in February, a guy who had been my preacher and one of my biggest encouragers uh, passed away very unexpectedly. His name was Bruce Heller. And over the years, I've probably spent more nights in his house than I have with anybody outside my own family because every year or two, he would invite me to come and preach, you know, the old school kind of revival, right? We're going to start on Wednesday. You're going to preach every night until the weekend. And whenever I would do that, he would invite me to stay with he and his wife, Dorothy, which I always enjoyed except for one thing. And here's the one thing I never enjoyed. Brother Bruce, every morning at 4.30 in the morning, would get up and he'd start humming and singing and clearing his throat, and you'd hear him all over the house. And then at 4.45, he would go down into this little makeshift office that he had set up in his basement, and from 4.45 in the morning until 7.45 in the morning, he would do three things. He would sing, he would pray, and he would read his Bible. Three hours every morning. 4.30 in the morning, 4.45, until 745. In fact, at his funeral, his kids even mentioned that he did that on vacation. Think about that. Now, I don't know about you. I always felt like my prayers got through better at 430 p.m. than they do 430 a.m., but that was his deal. Now, I've got a picture I want to show you. This picture was taken by his son, who's a megachurch preacher up in Indiana, uh, of his dad's desk. So this is his desk the day he died. And that's our picture, our newsletter. And the way he would do his prayer list, he would go through. And when I say, like, he's not working on sermons during this time. He's praying, reading his Bible, and singing. That's what he did every morning. And he would go through, and he had this huge pile. I wish we could take a field trip, just show you. I mean, just stacks of stuff. You couldn't even see him, you know, over the stacks of stuff. You know, newspaper clippings, newsletter articles, Bibles, books, sermon notes, and somehow... He knew where everything was, which was just mind-blowing. But the way he would do his prayer list, he'd go through his stack, and he would come to an article or a picture or something that reminded him of someone. Then he would pray for that person, then he'd put them at the bottom of the pile, and he'd move on to the next person. And rather than just making a list of names, he had a stack of, of reminders. So he died. He was 82 years old. He started preaching when he was 17. And during most of that time, he preached uh, at least three sermons a week and, and sometimes more if there was other stuff going on. So I went back and I did the math. And if you do the math, that comes out to a little more than 10,000 sermons. So think about this. Here's a guy, 10,000 sermons he's written. He's been up every morning at 430 for 60-something years, and he spends three hours of his morning praying and reading his Bible and singing. Now, now you would think a guy like that, you get to the end of your life, he retired three or four months before this, you would think, hey, it's time to let your foot off the gas a little bit. It's time to maybe coast on in. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible he hasn't read a thousand times. There's no prayer that he hasn't offered a thousand times. But you know what he did the day he died? Got up at 4.30 in the morning. And he went down in his little office. And for three hours, he read his Bible. He prayed. And he sang. So why would you do that? Because he knew that as you get closer to the finish line, it's not time to slow down. It's time to speed up. Let me ask you. As you get closer to the finish line, are you speeding up or are you slowing down? Is your faith growing? Are you still engaged? Or have you let it just sort of steady off and, and settle down and sort of stagnate? See, there's a sense in which if you want to have a happy ending, you have to, to run toward Jesus, not just, not just coast toward Jesus. You have, to, you have to remain engaged in the process until the moment you take your last breath because that's part of a happy ending. Now, here's the last thing. If you want to write a happy ending, you need to maintain an eternal perspective. 
want you to listen to the way Paul put this in verse 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I got another picture I want to show you. I see Lonnie setting up in the, the balcony. Uh, I know a lot of you over the last few weeks have been engaged in the baseball leagues out here that Lonnie runs with uh, Wayne County Parks and Rec. I've seen a lot of you out there, and, and you've been a part of it. So for the last uh, couple months, I've been coaching a coach's pitch team, which I told somebody, like, if you want to grow your spiritual life, here's what you have to do. You have to pray, read your Bible, give, and coach coaches pitch because that will improve your patience level and the Holy Spirit will have to work on your heart to bring you to a place to bring you to a new level in terms of your spiritual growth. The first part of the season, uh, to put it mildly, my team was struggling. Uh, some of you were there for some of that and it was just, it was not great. But during one particular night, we're getting ready to play a team that's pretty good. In fact, they're really good and they're coached by Jeff Sexton, who's a member here. He's on safety duty today, so if you see him after church, you can tell him I talked about him. Uh, and I knew, going in, I knew we're in trouble, right? We're not very good. They're pretty good. Bad combination. So I get my kids before the game, and I, I bring them all together and say, two things I don't want you to do during the game, all right? Two things. Don't look in the stands, and don't look at the scoreboard. Don't worry about what grandma's doing. Don't worry about any of that. And whatever you do, don't worry about the score. You just play your best. And if you play your best, the stands and the scoreboard will take care of themselves. So we start the game, and it goes about like I expected. And we get beat 11 to 1. And thankfully, Jeff Sexton called the dogs off, or it could have been worse. Uh, his favorite verse in Scripture is, Blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown mercy. That was him. He showed this preacher a lot of mercy. So we have our little, we have our little meeting afterwards. We have our snack, which is always the most important part of what happens at the ball game. And we're walking after the snack to the parking lot. And Bryce Gregory, who was here first service, goes to our church. He's the little guy. You can see his face. He's looking over my right shoulder. He's one of three that are paying attention to this high-level coaching that I'm offering. And we're walking, we've had our snack, and he's right beside me, and he says, uh, Coach, I've got a question. I said, what is it, buddy? He said, did we win or did we lose? <laughs> and as soon as he said that, I thought, man, I wish everybody listened like him. And then I answered his question. I said, buddy, we got killed. <laughs> but thanks for not looking at the scoreboard. <laughs> and I got to thinking about that. You know, sometimes when you look in the stands and when you look in the scoreboard, it's hard to tell who's winning and who's losing. You think about Paul's situation. He nears the end of his life. There's nobody there to cheer him on. The stands are empty. Most of his friends have abandoned him. It looks as if his enemies have finally triumphed over him. I mean, if you're keeping score at home, it does not look good for Paul. It does not look like this is going a good direction from an earthly perspective. But Paul knew something that his enemies didn't know, and he knew something that, that most of us struggle to remember, and that's that this life is not all there is. You don't get scored on this life. That's why rather than spending the final days of his life looking around, looking to see how everybody's reacting, looking at the school board, Paul instead looked forward to what he called the crown of righteousness that he expected Jesus himself to place on his head. He's talking about this, this wreath that they would use in the ancient world, that they would, they, an ornate wreath that they would give to the person who completed a marathon. Now, in these days, we use gold medals. In those days, they use these really ornate wreaths. But here's what you have to understand. You never get the wreath 
until you cross the finish line. You don't get it when you're halfway there. You don't get it when you're three quarters of the way there. And here's the problem for most of us. We get obsessed with thinking and living as if the good life is all about this life. But that's not true. What the Bible teaches and what Paul wanted us to know is that you don't have to spend your life looking for happy circumstances and happy people and living in happy places. All you have to do is focus on eternal life because Paul knew that the good life, the better story is not always about what happens now. It's about what happens next. It's not what the scoreboard says now. It's about what it's going to say then. And that's the good life. In his book, The Last Battle, which is the seventh and final novel in the popular Chronicle of Narnia series by C.S. Lewis, the great C.S. Lewis included a scene in which, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about, Aslan, who represents Jesus in all the books, is a lion. He sheds his lion's form, and he shares something with these kids that have been a part of the story about what's going to happen Next, I want you to listen to the way C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, and as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and so beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But then check out this next part. But for them... It was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Now, some literary critics have taken exception to that ending. They said that C.S. Lewis left too many questions unanswered. He left too many loose ends open. He left too much of the tension unresolved. But I think it's perfect because C.S. Lewis knew something that we struggle to remember, that this is not the end of the story. And when you take your last breath on this earth, when the, when the sand that is your life finally runs out, that is only the end of the title page. And there is a much longer, much better story that's coming if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've kept the faith. And Paul says that what happens next is so much better than what's happening now that they're not even worth comparing. I want you to stand with me. As we get ready to close, we're going to give you an opportunity to allow God to rewrite your story. If you're here this morning, you ever put your faith in Christ, maybe you've never been baptized into Christ, maybe you feel led to make this your church home, to be a part of your story. We had a young man in the first service that wanted to do that, uh, came and placed his membership here. Maybe you're not sure what you should do, you just know you need to do something Uh, David and I are going to be here. We'd be glad to meet with you, to pray with you. We won't do anything to embarrass you. Whatever you need to do, you come during this next song.